Special Lord's Day today, we're going to partake together of the Lord's table at the close of this sermon. We're going to remember the sacrificial death of the Lamb of God for us, the focal point of our faith and hope. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to pull out of Romans. It, it hurts me a little bit, but it's necessary. Uh, we'll take it back up next week, and we're just going to stare at the gospel of Jesus Christ this morning to prepare our hearts for the table with my prayer that our love for Christ would be aflame when we're finished. So we're going to look at an amazing passage of Scripture today, uh, one that has just blessed me greatly in my study this week, and I'm certain it will do the same for your soul. So if you'll turn with me to Revelation, Revelation chapter 5. It's the last book in your Bible, if you're having problems finding it. Um, turn with me to chapter 5. And, and John is going to bring us right into the throne room of heaven. We get to go behind the veil and we get a peek into what's going on as the Lord prepares to close up the history of the world. So it, it's a weighty text, but most beautiful. It's really a true crescendo of worship. If you'll just look with me in Revelation 4, verse 8. And the four living creatures, each one of them having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night, they do not cease to say, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever, and the 24 elders will fall down before him who sits on the throne and will worship him who lives forever and ever, and will cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will, they existed and they were created. And then if you'll jump to chapter 5, verse 11. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands. And they're saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all the things in them, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, Amen, Amen, Amen. And the elders fell down and they worshiped. So I want all of us to enter into this worship this morning. And what we're going to look at is Revelation chapter 5, verses 9 through 10, is the, the fountain of all the stream of this worship. And it's from the one that, that all this worship flows. And so I want us to consider this one this morning, and I want to close with abundant worship of our King as we partake of the table together and then join our voices together to sing one last song to a full Savior. So let me read the passage uh, that's before us, and then we will pray. Revelation chapter 5, verse 1. I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book and look into it. And John says, I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book and look into it. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders, the lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and he took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken that book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb and each one was holding a harp and the golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. For you were slain and you purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom of priests to our God, 
and they will reign upon the earth. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you will add the blessing now to this word. Holy Spirit, would you illuminate to the minds of these listeners this morning now, these truths. God, let them go deep into our understanding and go deep into our hearts until we join the chorus. God, that every one of us sing praise to the lamb that was slain for us. And so God, use this time now to lead us into remembrance of this lamb and to be blessed as the people of God. And it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. We'll just flip to chapter one of Revelation. I just want to open <clears throat> Revelation 1.1. 1, 1. John writes, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bondservants the things which must soon take place. And he sent and communicated it by his angel to his bondservant, John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is he who reads those who hear the words of the prophecy and heed the things which are written in it, for the time is near. And so who is writing this letter called Revelation? It's John, the beloved disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, the one who reclined at his bosom at the Last Supper, the one in the inner three. John is on the island called Patmos. Patmos is similar to Alcatraz. It was an island about 10 miles long and five miles wide. It was surrounded by crashing waves with mountainous volcanic rock. It was used to really destroy the spirits of the prisoners. It was like a chain gang, and they would have to break these rocks. And there were scourgings and fetters and insufficient food and dark caves. And the question is, why was John on Patmos? And in verse 9, it says, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and kingdom and perseverance which are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So his faithfulness, his proclaiming the truth of Jesus has landed him on Patmos. And so that is the one writing. It was at the time of Domitian, who was the ruler of the region, who was the Roman monarch. He hated Christians and he was persecuting them greatly. He had outlawed Christianity and John, the beloved disciple, has been exiled to Patmos. And most would place him as he wrote this in his 80s or 90s. And what is amazing here is Patmos is the door to maybe the most glorious communion any man has ever had on the face of the earth. He'll be brought into the throne room of heaven, and it's going to be revealed the most extensive revelation of future things ever given to man. And God has always seemed pleased to reveal himself uh, deepest to the ones in suffering. And so on this day, in Revelation 1.10, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me, a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. And so it's on Sunday. He's in the spirit. Verse 11 is a sound of a trumpet, maybe similar to Mount Sinai. We hear that description. And it's just powerful and loud and a commanding voice in heaven. And this revelation comes from. And as we move to, he writes to the seven churches, we now move into chapter four and we're brought into this glorious worship in heaven. And as we see the, the, the one on the throne, God the Father being worshipped, the, the focus now narrows in chapter 5, and that's where we'll find ourselves. And it starts to focus on this scroll. The, 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 the one who's sitting on the throne in heaven is holding a scroll. And so God the Father is holding a scroll. Look with me in uh, Revelation 5.1. I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne, a book that was written inside and on the back, and it's sealed up with seven seals. And so the question is, what is the scroll now that we're going to start focusing in in chapter five? And praise God, as I dug in on this, almost all of the conservative scholars and commentators I had were in agreement on it. And that always helps when it's not varied. And they're saying that the scroll, which I think is an accurate translation as you follow Revelation is the unfolding purpose and plan of God for the world as God wraps it up, as he, he vindicates his name. He brings judgment upon the world and the, the full salvation of his chosen ones whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And so this is the, the end. The scroll has to be opened for the hope of the world. 
to bring judgment upon those who have raised themselves up against God, the Father, and to bring this mighty salvation to its full consummation of all that God designed it to be. It has to be open. And it shows that God has decreed the end from the beginning. It's his plan. It's his purpose. It's his scroll. Jehovah reigneth. This is how history will end. And I want you to notice that the book is written on the inside and on the back. And that's not how you wrote on a scroll. It's, it's, It's written, it was supposed to be written on the inside and it's written on both to show that there'll be no new things written into this scroll. There'll be nothing added to God's plan and program and fulfillment. The revelation of God is complete. God's plan has been established. His purpose will will ripen. It will come to pass. There is no place for any more writing, no new revelations, no new additions. God will win and he will wind up all of history worshiping at his feet or or abiding under his wrath for all of eternity. So I want you to look at me in verse 2. And then I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? Who, Who can open this scroll so that history can wind down and finish? Who's able to take it and open it? And in heaven, in verse 3, no one, no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or look into it. Nobody can open this scroll. In verse 4, John says, I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. It's, it, it has to be opened for salvation to come to consummation, for God's judgment, to, his name to be vindicated. This scroll has to be open, and there's nobody who can open it, and he's just sitting there weeping. And in verse 5, one of the elders said to John, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. One of the most powerful statements in the Bible. Stop weeping. And he draws this beautiful Old Testament language. I'd love to do a sermon on each one of those statements. The lion from the tribe of Judah and the root of David the king. He's overcome. So by overcoming, he can open the book in its seven seals. He's worthy to open it. And in verse six, I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders, a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And so John looks over and he expects to see a mighty lion. And as he looks, he sees a lamb. And the Greek word is is a sacrificial lamb. And so he sees a lamb that's been sacrificed and it's been slaughtered. This lamb, as he looks over, has been slain. And he's standing. And your first question is, how does a slaughtered lamb stand? Well, because he was put in a grave for three days and he has risen. And he's brought about salvation. And he's a lamb standing. And this is the resurrected lamb of God who took away the sins of the world. This is the one who is dead and is alive forevermore. This is the lion lamb. This is the one who's mighty and omnipotent and slaughtered in humility. He's meekness and majesty. The destiny of the whole human race is taken up in this slain lamb. He overcame. But how did the Lion of Judah overcome our enemies? And it's in the most amazing way that he was born into a manger. He came clothed in humility. On Palm Sunday, he he rode a donkey instead of a steed to conquer. He went up onto a cross and died in our place. This is not how a lion overcomes. A lion overpowers. A lion is ferocious. And here's the lion of Judah, who was a lamb slain. This victory by the lion was won in humility, 
by hanging on a cross. That is the paradox of the gospel that we will never get over. And so what we remember this morning at the table is the lion who was a lamb that was slaughtered on our place, in our place. That's Christianity. He's the only one worthy who, who the one who holds that scroll in his hand, the eternal destiny of the whole human race, he will determine all of its culmination, all of its history, and we need that one to be a savior. And so the one who's worthy to open it up is the savior of mankind. And John is just amazed at what he sees. And in verse 7, he came, this lamb, and he took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne. So he's worthy to open this scroll. He's worthy to actually walk up to the one sitting on the throne that the angels are going, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He's, he's, he can walk up into his presence and he's able to open it. And, and if it wasn't Jesus, the scroll would just slaughter the entire universe. Everyone would be cast into hell for all of eternity. And this is the only one who can hold the scroll. And, and God's uh, wrath must be vindicated, his justice. His glory must be shown for what it truly is and how mankind has degraded it and trampled it and belittled it. We've worshipped a beast, the devil, and not God. To, we've worshipped creation instead of the creator. We all have sinned and we lack the glory of God. We haven't treasured God for who he is and what he is. And that needs to be judged. So this is big. It's significant. It must be punished. Judgment must come. But there is mentioned in this section a group that is going to be saved out of the nations. He says there's people from every tribe, tongue, people, and nation. So my question is, how can this scroll be opened then? Because the Father couldn't open it without consuming the world in justice and wrath for all of eternity. And the Father in his patience waits for the one who shows the world that God does not just sweep our sin under the rug to show that he is just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus Christ, to show the worthiness of God and his glory. And this preaches to us that God is love. He won't open this seal without a savior. Isn't that beautiful? He waits for the lamb because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There's only one mediator between God and man. And it must be the lion lamb to open up this scroll. No one else was found worthy. No one else is able. So instantly the worthiness of the lamb and his ability to take the scroll is declared and just put on display. He alone has a right to bring history to an end for the glory of his name and the good of his people. He can open that scroll. Without Jesus, all is doom. All would be doom and destruction. We would all weep with John in verse 4. We'd all weep and be under the eternal wrath of God forever. Just, we'd weep. He must come forth to bring a salvation to the world and not just a judgment. And so he is the one that came and took it from the hand of God the Father to open it. Look with me in verse 8. When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They just begin to worship because of who took the scroll and his worthiness. And the harp represented just that joyful worship throughout the whole Old Testament. And they're worshiping. And the golden bowls of incense for the prayers of the saints, and some said it's the prayers of the martyrs that were crying out, vindicate us, vindicate us. Others just say it's the prayers of the saints always going up to God. But what we see is they all join together and they worship, and they worship the Lamb in heaven. And the only way that he could be worshiped with the souls of men made perfect and angels is if, is, is if he's God. 
And so you want a verse to show that Jesus Christ is God. Here is the souls made perfect, worshiping the Lamb of God as Jehovah God. This worship explodes, and it just keeps getting expansive to the ends of the earth. It's, it's all set into motion when the Lamb takes up the scroll out of the hand of the Father. Because now God's purposes will come to pass for what we have all been waiting for, what everyone prays and longs for this uh, vindicating and putting God's beauty and display on, on, on for all of eternity. His name, His glory, His judgment, His great salvation, His worship. And now the plan of God for how He will close up all of history can now be revealed and can be executed. And that's the rest of the book of Revelation. In chapter 6, these seals are opened and the mighty wrath of God begins to be poured out upon the world that has rejected him. All those who would mock and say he's not going to come back, it's the same as in the days of Noah, and, and, and he opens these seals and the wrath of God has always been there and it's been being held back until the scroll would be opened. And the power of God is poured out. His wrath is not just a warning. It's been delayed until the appointed time when that scroll could be opened by a lion lamb to bring this to completion. And then look with me in verse 9. And then they sang a new song. They sang a new song because he's worthy. He is worthy. Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. And so I want to show you as we now prepare our hearts for the table, it tells us why is he worthy? Why is he worthy to take that seal? And he tells us in verse 9 and 10 three things because he was slaughtered, because he purchased a people with his blood, and he made a kingdom and priest to our God who will reign upon the earth forever. And that makes him worthy. So let's take a look at why he's worthy. In verse 9, worthy are you to take the book, Jesus, and break its seals, for you were slain. The one who is worthy to take it up the one who's worthy of our worship because this lion was slaughtered. He was slain. His life was violently and sacrificially ended. He was hung up on a cross and pierced through for our transgression. Your blood, O worthy one, was spilled out for the redemption, for the salvation of your people. Never get over who the one is that's being slain, this one who's worshiped, this one who's holy, holy, holy. He's the one who was slain on our behalf. And so there are kind of two Old Testament references that come to mind right away when this is, is stated as the Passover lamb, the one whose blood was, was put on the doorpost and slaughtered. So when the wrath of God came, it passed over the Israelites. And the other, I think I'm going to read it, flip over to Isaiah 53, the suffering servant. Isaiah 53, I just want to start in verse 1. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he, Jesus, grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of a parched ground. He has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him, this great humility he was despised and he was forsaken of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and like one from whom men hide their face. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely our griefs he himself bore, and our sorrows he carried, yet we ourselves esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was pierced through for our transgressions. The lion lamb was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. He who was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter, and like a sheep that is silent before its shears. So he did not open his mouth. 
the Lamb of God. He's worthy to be praised because he was slaughtered in our place for our sin. And he voluntarily entered the world to lay down his life and be slaughtered as a substitute for what we deserve for our sin. And so I declare this morning, he is worthy. He is worthy. And I want to focus on this a little more in the second reason why he's worthy. As it says, he purchased for God with, with your blood, men from every, his blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. So something great was accomplished by the shedding of the blood that we'll remember this morning. The Greek word is agorazo, and it's kind of the, maybe the plainest definition of this word for redemption. And it meant to buy something or someone out of a marketplace. And you had to pay a price to, to buy it. And in our text, we're told that Jesus bought us out of slavery to sin, the law, condemnation, and he bought us out of slavery for our God. He, he purchased us for God. And so the ransom that had to be paid to purchase us was a lamb that had to be slaughtered. He had to spill his blood in death. Jesus came and he, he paid it. He paid the ransom, his blood in 1 Peter 1.18 knowing that you were not redeemed the ransom price with perishable things like silver or gold, but you were, you, you were redeemed um, from, with precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ, a perfect lamb, a perfect life, laid out, spilled out. That was the redemption price. And so he gets on that cross and breathes his last and drops every drop of blood for our sins and salvation. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. And he did it to Agarazzo, a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. This bloodshedding buys a people for God to bring us back to him. And the whole fulfillment of that new covenant, I'll be their God and they'll be my people. And he purchased us to come into that sweet place. And so what we were purchased from, flip back to Revelation chapter 1, 1 verse 5, what were we purchased from? <clears throat> and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be the glory forever and ever and the dominion forever. Amen. In verse 9, he purchased for God, chapter 5, with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. He freed us from our sins. He paid the price by hanging on the cross for our sins. The price for the soul that sins must die. And Jesus came and he paid the ransom to redeem us to God. The penalty for our sin was paid in full on the cross. And that's why he's a standing slain lamb. He accomplished our salvation. To purchase us, hear that, for God. The payment was the blood of the lamb. And now we can be free from the condemnation from God for our sins. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It's not ours to pay any longer. Paid in full by the Lamb, resurrected, standing Lamb. And so get this, he paid the price that our sins demanded by God himself. The sword of justice had to pierce a breast. It had to go through. And Jesus Christ bore it. So that now there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And secondly, he redeemed us. He redeemed us from worshiping the beast. We come in this world loving the God of this world, serving him, serving self, worshiping everything but God. And he came and redeemed it. Listen to Revelation 13 verse 7. And it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And authority over every tribe and people and tongue and nation was given to him. And all who dwell on the earth will worship him. 
Everyone whose name was not written from the foundation of the world in the book of life of the Lamb who has been slain. The whole world will worship this beast, the devil. And all the peoples on the face of the earth will worship him. That's our world, except one group whose names were written in the Lamb's book of life. To the ones who came and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as the one whose blood was slain in their behalf for salvation. We are saved from the sway and allegiance of the beast by the blood of the Lamb. And I want you to treasure that this morning, that you worship God instead of the beast in this world and its system. Our being purchased by the Lamb stops the worship of the beast. And we join in the chorus that we see in Revelation, and now we're the worshipers of God. And we sing a new song. And I pray that we sing this song from our hearts. We have been released. We have been bought from the worship of the devil to worship the Lamb of God who was slain and purchased for himself a people for God. Thank you, God, for this new song that I have in my heart. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. So we are freed from sin. We are bought by Jesus to have new hearts to worship the Lamb of God now. You have been set free to worship the only one worthy, Jesus Christ. And thirdly, we are redeemed, he said, from the wrath of God. What what we'll read about in this awful book as it's unfolded. Let's read one to you. Revelation 14, listen to verse 9. Then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast in his image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. We are purchased from the wrath of God, and it's coming. And the Lamb is the only one who can get the wrath of God off of you when this seal is opened. And all of your church going and all of your morality, cleaning yourself up will never stop the wrath of God when that is opened. The only thing that can appease it is the propitiation of Jesus Christ hanging on a cross, draining the full wrath for all of our sins until there's none left. There's not even a drop left. The lamb is the only one who can get that wrath off when the judgment of God begins. You're free from the condemnation of sin. You have a new heart to worship the lamb. And you are free from the eternal wrath of God because the one who bore it in our place. And what did he purchase us for? He says, for God. He purchased us to give us to to God. For God, to bring us back into this relationship. And look in verse 10. You've made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God. He purchased for us a a kingdom with God as our king and us as kingly priesthood. I was studying this week, and the first time that God made this promise uh, in verse 10 uh, that you'll be a kingdom and priest to our God, he made it to all of Israel. And he said that all of Israel, you're going to be a kingdom of priests. Listen to Exodus 19.1. We got enough time. In the third month... After the sons of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that very day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. When they set out from Rephidim, they came to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness, and there Israel camped in front of the mountain, and and he's about to go up now and receive the law. And Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. I brought you to me. 
Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant that he's about to make with Moses, then you shall be my own possession among the peoples. For all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, Israel. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel, God said to Moses. What a promise. If the covenant is kept, you're going to be a kingdom of priests. And Moses goes up to Sinai then and receives the law. And while he's getting it from God, he comes down with the two tablets of stone, the Ten Commandments. And as he comes down, what does he see Israel doing? A worship service, praising God for what he's given to them. He comes down and they're worshiping a golden calf. And the first commandments are now broken. And Moses takes those tablets and he shatters them. Right while they're getting the covenant, it's it's like committing adultery on your wedding night. They're, they're receiving this from God, and while they're doing it, they're worshiping an idol. And Moses goes back up, and God establishes the priesthood through the tribe now of Aaron. And he's going to go through the Levites and very specific to Aaron, and they're going to be a kingdom of priests. Because Israel needed priests to be a mediator now between God and man. And in Exodus 19.6, right there, a covenant keeper, the lion lamb, so that now all are priests to God and the new covenant. And I want you to hear this. This was a big point in the Reformation. They called it the priesthood now of all believers. And if you're in Christ, you're a priest. Jesus was our high priest, and he he made a sacrifice. He made the payment for sin, and he he now intercedes for us before the throne. And now we in Christ are priests who offer up praise to our God. He made us a kingdom of priests. I don't need another human mediator between God and me. The veil's torn in two in Christ. I go right into his presence now. I can go right to God 24-7. I can pray to God, and he hears, and they're they're golden incense up there in glory. Prayers right now. I don't need a human mediator any longer. I can now, by the blood of Jesus, go right into the Holy of Holies and give my prayers to God. Thank you, Jesus. I can give him praise now. I can sing a new song. I can do Romans 12.1. I can offer up worship to God by giving myself to him and serving him, and it's accepted. We are all a kingdom of priests to our God under the new covenant. Do you realize the gift of what you have? You've been purchased for God, and now through Jesus, you can go right into his presence and know him and love him and commune with him. This is the, I don't know why we forsake that. The whole gospel is for God. I purchased you for God. Not so you can walk around and smile and say, when I die, I go to heaven and and I I help homeless people. I do this. He purchased you for God. Don't lose the glory and the beauty of the new covenant. And they will reign upon the earth. What a song we have, saints of God. And so let us get the harps And just sing praise to our God. Let our thanksgiving and our praises and our worship be be endless, ceaseless. Let us join this chorus in heaven who is just worshiping the lion lamb for what he's done. Let us sing praises to the one who paid for our sins and redeemed us and got the wrath of God off us and brought us back to God. Let us do verse 11. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. With that context now, just worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing and every created thing which is in heaven on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them. I heard them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures just kept saying amen and the elders are just falling down and worshiping before him. I pray that for Southside.
So let me ask you this morning, as one who's been created by this God, where do you stand in proximity to this lamb that we've just saw presented in heaven? What have you done with Jesus Christ? Is he something that's just a verbal profession? That isn't going to get you through when these, when these seals are opened up. You're really at a crossroad this morning, and it's a divine appointment by God. There is a day appointed when he will take this seal and he's going to break it open. And the judgment of God will begin for those who have worshipped the beast. This world and its system, self-pleasure, defaming God and his worth, with an eternal heaven and an eternal hell at the end of this book. And the, term, the determination of whether you go to heaven or hell will be what did you do with the lamb who came into this world and paid the price for our sins and redeemed us and made us a kingdom of priests. What have you done with Jesus Christ? Today is a day of grace. He's offering, come to me, and I'll rescue you from that. It's a free offer of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You bring nothing. You come empty. You look away from anything in you. No resolves, resolutions, moralities. You come and you look at the slam that was slain in your place. And you believe. And you submit to the lion. And you join the myriads of angels and you worship Jesus Christ. You sing a new song with the rest of the days that God has given to you. And for the rest of us, we now will go to the table of remembrance. We're going to join our hearts together before the, the lampstand who's in our presence this morning, Jesus Christ, the lion lamb. As we've been laboring through Romans chapter 12, we're going to come to the table as those who don't offer up our bodies the way that we desire. Still conform to the world and its thinking in different ways. Still prideful as I walk into this body about my gifts and abilities and still not using the gift that God's given me for the good of others. Still hypocrisy in my love. My love of the brethren is a flicker just want to come to the table and look that there is a lamb whose blood was shed for our sin that can wash it away as far as the east is from the west. And I love that statement. I will remember your sins no more, says God. I'll throw them behind my shoulder. I'll throw them into forgetfulness. That's what, the, that's what this blood does. And though not perfect, I'm redeemed to God. And I'm done worshiping the beast and this broken, fallen world. I'm a kingdom of priests. I live in communion with God. I have free access through the work of Jesus Christ. It's finished. And I can go in and dwell with God now. What a gift. So this morning, let us look at the lion who became the lamb of God for us that we could have all of this. And that's what we're going to remember now. And I just ask that you would look your eyes out at Jesus Christ while we remember this now at the table. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask the ushers to come forward. They're going to pass out the elements. Um, if you're an unbeliever, we ask that you would not partake of this. What you need is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and surrender to him. This ordinance will do nothing to benefit you. But for those who have the gift of faith, I pray now that we would examine just a time to look and see how worthy he is and confess sin and just spend this time of looking at the beauty of what he's done, that my sins are gone. And I just want you to stare and remember now what Jesus Christ has done for you. What a gift, what an ordinance that he has left for us. I'm going to pray and then if you men would pass that out. Father, thank you. For this glimpse into heaven, <laughs> thank you for what you revealed to John that day. God, thank you for the vindication of your name that's coming, the treasuring of your glory the way that it should be. 
And thank you that you're a God of mercy. I thank you that you have designed all of history to show mercy to Jew and Gentile. God, for all the nations now can call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. I pray if there's any in our midst who never have, that even now, God, before you, that they would cry out and they would look to Jesus Christ for the only way to have their sins washed away and that they would believe in that name. That is the name above every name. Lord, grant salvation to any soul that needs it this morning. God, I pray that our hearts now would just be amazed, that we would join the chorus, that we would praise you and just celebrate now remembering what the lion lamb did for us and that though our sins were scarlet, they are as white as snow. God, let us be overwhelmed that we've been purchased. We've been purchased to you. The wrath is off us. And now we're a kingdom of priests to our God. We can serve you, draw near to you, worship you, and love you. God, thank you for such a gospel. And we give glory and praise and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's in his name that we do pray. Amen.